Is Mr. Rocher, yes. Mr. Rocher, just state your name, who you represent, and your position on the bill, please. Thank you. My name is uh, Nelson Roach. I'm testifying on behalf of myself and the Texas Trial Lawyers Association, and I am testifying uh, against the bill. Um, as, as Mr. Workman said, you kind of have to get in the weeds on this issue to understand it, uh, although um, I would argue that it's a very significant issue, uh, and it's not as simple, I think, as Mr. Christian uh, has laid out. First of all, I think it's important to remember that there's a big difference between the workers' compensation system and the tort system. The workers' compensation system is a no-fault system. In other words, compensation is provided regardless of fault. The second major difference between, and, and on the other hand, the tort system on the other hand is based on culpable conduct. There can be no responsibility, no transfer of responsibility unless there is a finding of culpable conduct, unless someone has done something wrong negligent, gross negligent, reckless conduct, intentional conduct. The second major difference between the workers' compensation system is that the workers' compensation system, and this is very important, the workers' compensation system is not designed to make the employee whole. It is designed to provide some compensation, and it is a trade-off. That trade-off of... Uh, of, of no requirement of liability, of no fault, is a trade-off to the difference in the tort system, which the tort system is specifically designed in those limited circumstances where there is culpable conduct to make the person whole, the victim whole. That's a big difference. The second aspect that uh, is a change, a major issue, that is one of the reasons why this particular issue is coming into focus now is that until 19, excuse me, until 2008, the conventional belief was that uh, the ability of a premises owner to also be a general contractor and have an OSIP policy that would provide immunity, it was not believed that that was the case in Texas. That you couldn't do it in Texas? That you couldn't do it. Under so in other statute, words, where this would come into play is in a lot of these, these places down on the coast, uh, the uh, refineries, uh, chemical companies, steel mills, big plants, where the owner acts as the general contractor. It was believed under those circumstances that you couldn't have an OSIP policy and that immunity would work downstream to the subcontractors that would come in. In 2008, there was a case called Entergy, and the Supreme Court interpreted the statute that we're talking about here today to say that, in fact, an owner of the premises can also be a general contractor. That was a big change in what people believe the law to be. And as a result of that, before then, the statute we're talking about that applies that says that a contractor, a general contractor, can be a deemed employee, only applied to what we talk about, what we think about as traditional construction situations, which is like we're building a building, we're building a house, or something like that. It greatly expanded what was, what was known to be uh, the coverage of this immunity. So that is, is the situation that existed after 2008, in the 2009 legislative session, a bill was introduced uh, in the House uh, to repeal that energy decision. It was heard in this committee. Uh, it was a majority Republican committee at that time. It was voted out and it was voted to the floor of the House and it was also passed out of the House. It, unfortunately, it was passed too late out of the session. Um, for it to get through the Senate, and it died in the Senate. But the point is, is that the, the understanding of the system changed very, very significantly after 2008. Now, that brings us to the situation that we have here, and what we have here is what people commonly call, they say it's a reverse OSIP situation. And what that means is, instead of a situation in which the employer has purchased the workers' comp 
uh, coverage and a uh, uh, subcontractor's employee is injured on the owner's premises, we have the opposite situation. We have a situation in which the statute says, as the statute says, you have an independent contractor who is hired by a general contractor who in an OSIP situation is a premises owner to come on the premises and by the terms of the written contract, the, uh, the owner of the premises or the general contractor specifies that the control over the work is solely undertaken by the subcontractor. And so that, that doesn't brings remove up, his liability, though, does it? What's that? I'm sorry. It doesn't remove the GC's liability, does it? it well, that's that's the, the question this bill raises: is is does that remove the uh, does that remove the liability of the subcontractor? Under, yeah. Okay. Well, because here we have a situation. I, I'll give you an example. Let's say we have a uh, 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 a chemical facility, and they have a problem with their boiler. Mm -hmm. And they hire a subcontractor who is a, uh, a, a boiler expert to come in and diagnose the problem and fix the problem with the boiler. Then the boy, that subcontractor is careless in how they do that. Under the terms of the contract, the, by the terms of the written contract, that subcontractor is given complete control over that work site and complete responsibility for that job. Nonetheless, let's say two, three months later, uh, the boiler blows up. And say, for example, you know, you have a police officer, for example, who's a night watch working right. as a, you know, a night watchman, and he's on the premises, and he gets injured in that <laughs> explosion, but he's an employee of the general contractor. The general contractor had no participation in fixing the boiler, no participation in creating the hazard, but unfortunately, this this. But in that contract with the subcontractor, wouldn't wouldn't the workers' comp scenario been covered? Hey, I'm 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 doing an OSEP or a CSEP or whatever. Wouldn't that have been covered in that contract? So workers, everybody would know where they stand. For workers' comp, there would be coverage. Okay. The question is: Is should there be tort liability by the subcontractor for their careless conduct? That's case. the policy decision that this bill raises and addresses. So it's not really under the workers' comp. It's under tort liability as to whether or not there could be actual or punitive damages. And what, what this bill would do is this bill would, would expand the tort immunity from the uh, uh, subcontractor to the, uh, from the general contractor to the subcontractor. Gotcha. Okay. Now, the question is, from a policy standpoint, is that a, is that a good idea from the policy standpoint? And I would argue no. I think it's been, it's been pointed out numerous times in the testimony earlier uh, today that Texas uh, has the highest death rate. It has the highest injury rates in the nation. And we know that... Well, because we got all the jobs right now. And, <laughs> but we, we also know that construction has the highest injury and death rates. Uh, and so what we're talking about here is we're talking about people who are working in highly hazardous situations. And so I... The question is, is does the tort system serve as a deterrent? And I would argue that it does, and I would argue that it does for a number of reasons, one of which is um, because people can be held liable and accountable in a court of law, it tends to have a deterrent effect. Secondly, um, in the usual situation, as, as Mr. Mark Workman mentioned, these OSIP and CSIP situations involve large projects. This is not, we're not talking about the mom and pop situation or the home builder or things like that. So under those circumstances, um, that is a situation where it is highly hazardous and it is a situation in which the parties are, the contracting parties are sophisticated parties and they know what they're doing. They usually have lawyers on both sides negotiating or contracting officers that negotiate these agreements. And so under those circumstances, the, the parties can contract for whether or not there is going to be the general contractor will maintain control over the subcontractor. And so by virtue of that contracting right, they can make a decision 
as to whether or not this, this immunity will or won't apply. But the other aspect of that is, is in the usual case in these large contracts, the, the general contractor will require that the subcontractor buy a liability insurance policy. Now, how does that have an effect upon uh, encouraging safety? Here's why. Because that in order to buy that liability policy, that an insurance company wants to protect itself from unscrupulous or unqualified subcontractors. And the usual practice for situations like for you know, a process control subcontractor or a boiler contractor or someone like that that is engaged in these highly hazardous activities, the insurance companies will have a, a compliance requirement before they will agree to issue a liability policy. So in other words, they, it operates as a check. The insurance company says, do you have an OSHA compliance program? Do you have a qualified OSHA officer? What is your training of your employees, not only for safety, but for uh, actual knowledge of, of your business. And so there is, there is, an, there is a non-governmental private oversight process that occurs by the insurance industry in protecting itself and protecting its rates. And that leads to lower, uh, to higher safety. Members, any questions? Yes, Chairman. Representative Collier. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Roach, thank you for this information. So uh, just to follow up on your last point, because I, I have a couple other questions that I want to ask you, but if the uh, if this bill is passed, then the subcontractor would not need liability insurance, would they? That's correct. So uh, the checks and balances that you talked about uh, for the liability insurance, meaning that you have a safety program in place, that you're following the OSHA requirements, they wouldn't even need it because... They can mess up all they want, and they wouldn't be sued because they have immunity through this bill. They wouldn't have the insurance company as a check on on the, the uh, subcontractor on that issue. So it's just another uh, measure or, or uh, you know, a, a way that we can show that this particular subcontractor is up to date with OSHA requirements and, and is, um, you know, doing all they can to have safety programs in place in their business, right? Correct. Okay, so then I wanted to talk to you about, because um, we had so many bills and not all of us had time to read everything, so I, I needed to play catch up on this. Um, so if the, right now, if the uh, general contractor tells, ha signs an agreement with the subcontractor that says, I'm going to pay for the workers' comp coverage for your uh, for your employees. If the subcontractor messes up, can the employees of the contractor sue the subcontractor? Can the employees of the contractor sue the subcontractor? So I know that the general contractor is immune because they have the workers' comp coverage. Does that uh, immunity pass through to the subcontractor? It depends. Okay. It depends upon whether or not there is a written agreement that says the sole responsibility for the details of the work lie with the subcontractor. Okay. So in other words, if the general contractor retains control over the work or there's no written agreement, then uh, that's a situation in which the immunity applies. All right. Okay, because uh, I think that you said something about earlier about there was a conflict People think that there's a conflict between 122 and 123. Right, and but there's not. I didn't see that either because it seems like it only apl 122 applies in one situation and 123 applies in a different type of situation. And there's there's been two two arguments made that there's a conflict. The first argument's been made that there's a conflict between the uh, TIC Energy case, which was decided by the Corpus Christi Court in January the 8th of this year, and uh, another case called the uh, Etai case, which is a 2004 opinion out of, uh, out of Houston. And actually, first of all, in the Etai case, and it, the Etai case is another reverse OPSIT situation. In other words, this is another situation in which the subcontractor's employees are alleged to have done something negligent to enter the general contractor's employees. And in that case, the court held that there can't, that situation can occur where that the deemed employer, the immunity, can apply. But the issue about whether this Section 2 applied 
was was not an issue in that opinion. Okay. And so there is no conflict between the ETI decision and this decision. The second argument is is in the uh, in the TIC op uh, opinion, the, T the the TIC opinion used some un what I thought was some unfortunate language. It said that there was an in it said there was an irreconcilable conflict between Section A and Section B. And in fact, um, what the court went on to do was, was to reconcile the conflict and, and render the, a holding, uh, which I would argue is the correct holding. And basically in doing that, what it did is it, it followed a time-honored uh, rule of statutory construction, which is if, a, if two provisions of a statute are at first glance uh, in seemingly in conflict, you look at the two provisions and find out which one is the general provision and which one is the more specific provision. And the more specific provision is interpreted to be an exception to the general rule. And that's exactly what the court did in that opinion, even though it used the unfortunate words, conflict. irreconcilable conflict. Okay. It, it wasn't an irreconcilable conflict. But the opinion is the law. No, the opinion right. is is the law today. Yeah. Okay, I understand. Um, I want to make and, sure that um, it um, um, it's on appeal to the to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court will decide the opinion ultimately. Um, but as to whether or not it's a conflict, I think the, right. the court reached the right result, but it used some unfortunate That's language to get there. Yeah. Thank you. Anything okay. else, Ms. Well, I, I just want to make sure that, um, we want to protect our workers, and and I don't know. It sounds like. By giving complete immunity um, to subcontractors, and you know, I can just contract it out. I can just sign an agreement, and then it doesn't matter whether I have a safe work environment because I'm immune anyway. This is a question between immunity and responsibility, and it's also a question of value because uh, if the immunity is is expanded. Uh, to apply un under this circumstance, it would mean that if you had a situation in which a subcontractor caused damage on the premises of, say, a, you know, say you had again going back to the boiler example, the the boiler contractor uh, negligently repairs the, the boiler and an explosion occurs, and as a result of that explosion, the boiler's destroyed and three of the premises owners' employees are killed. Under that circumstance, uh, under this bill, the uh, subcontractor would be immune, would be responsible for the property damage, but it would be immune from responsibility for the people damage. Okay. So they would have to pay for the repair to the, the business and the boiler, but the harm that it caused to the people, the deaths that it wrecked, they, they would not have any recourse. Correct. Now, Okay, so if, if since there was workers' comp, the only reason they can sue is for gross neg negligence. Is that right? Or that is correct. So it's not like you can just sue because of any. It has to. You have a higher standard, a higher burden to prove in order to even file a lawsuit. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, so it's not like we're just saying we're opening up for all lawsuits. Um, we want to keep it so that way, if there's gross negligence, which is a higher burden to prove they should have that avenue available. Yeah, but the argument that, well, the person is going to be compensated otherwise by virtue of workers' comp doesn't take into account that, as I indicated before, mm -hmm. workers' compensation does not and is not designed to make the worker whole or to make the worker's family whole. It is a compromise. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, all right. Is there anyone else wishing to testify live on the bill?